On this episode of Pocket Pedagogy, we're going ape! I... I thought it was funny. I'd like you to take a moment and think about the great rivalries of our culture. Ali versus Frazier, Jordan versus Bird, Rock versus Scissors. Let me introduce one more into the equation. That's right, Mario and Donkey Kong have had beef going back over four decades, and the two have been intertwined inextricably ever since they both debuted back in 1981. Donkey Kong, as the story goes, was the brainchild of design wunderkind Shigeru Miyamoto, who, alongside chief engineer and later handheld game mastermind Gunpei Yokoi, used his love of classic monster movies and cartoons to turn unsold units of Nintendo's radar scope arcade machine into a game that people actually wanted to play. Our plucky little mustachioed friend, known simply at the time as Jumpman, climbed four perilous levels to rescue lovely Pauline from her gigantic ape kidnapper, ultimately defeating the big fella and cementing both characters' place in video game lore. The game was followed by two sequels, Donkey Kong Jr., which has the younger Kong trying to rescue his imprisoned father from the now antagonistic Mario, and Donkey Kong 3, which, uh, was certainly, definitely, one of the video games to ever be released. While Mario and Donkey Kong would become kart racing and tennis playing bros over the years, that rivalry became a key part of Nintendo's brand and the genesis of both characters. But arguably, the greatest culmination of that rivalry came with 1994's Donkey Kong for the Game Boy, the subject of this week's episode of Pocket Pedagogy. There is, of course, a mercenary sort of timeliness to this episode of Pocket Pedagogy. On February 16th, 2024, Nintendo will release a remake of Mario vs. Donkey Kong, that's the Game Boy Advance sequel to the game we're talking about today, for the Nintendo Switch. Now, this is honestly a pretty good call. The original Mario vs. Donkey Kong is not a terrible video game, but the strange insistence on many Game Boy Advance developers' part to use pre-rendered sprites on such a small screen results in a game that often looks like a blurry mess, and lacks much of DK94's charm. So hopefully, this high-resolution remaster of that sequel will make an okay game into a really good one. But again, if you want the absolute apex of the Donkey Kong franchise, and maybe the Game Boy as a platform, you have to go with the 1994 version of Donkey Kong. The game was developed by Nintendo's Entertainment Analysis and Development Division, more commonly known as Nintendo EAD. Masayuki Kameyama and Takeo Shimizu were directors under Mario's dad himself, Shigeru Miyamoto, acting as producer. Now, it should be noted that DK94, as we're going to try to refer to it as from here on out, just to make things easier, was part of a conspicuous Donkey Kong renaissance. DK94 was released in the summer of 1994, go figure, but it was overshadowed by another ambitious Donkey Kong project, Rare's Donkey Kong Country, on the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. That dropped in November of 1994. Now, that game utilized cutting-edge pre-rendered sprites derived from CGI models rendered on Silicon Graphics workstations, and it was so visually striking and successful, it helped push off the decline of the Super NES for at least another few years. Now, that's a great game, and yes, Retro nerds, Donkey Kong Country is, and was, and will always be a great game, and I don't care if you don't like it, but we're getting a bit far afield. Now, in a lot of ways, DK94 was also trying to push at the boundaries of what its aging hardware could do. While it lacked the raw graphical power of the SNES game, due to, you know, being on a Game Boy, it made up for it by offering 101 total stages across nine different worlds, as well as a much more nimble version of Mario than it appeared in the original game. They gave him a plethora of different acrobatic moves to master, 
Tons of different environments, puzzles, different enemies. It was even the first Game Boy game designed to take advantage of the Super Game Boy peripheral for the SNES. Basically, you plug the cartridge into it, you plug that into your SNES, and then when you played it on a TV, you got a lovely color palette for the game, as well as a fun arcade-styled border. Really nice. Now, the premise of the game is pretty straightforward. In fact, it starts off as a carbon copy of the original arcade game, with Mario chasing the big ape across the same four stages he did back in 1981. Once you beat that, however, players might have been surprised to find that a whole new world opens up, with Donkey Kong fleeing further into the city, and then later into environments like a cargo plane, the jungle, an iceberg, and a mountain. The game utilizes its limited color palette and memory space effectively, with charming character designs and animations that give the whole thing a ton of personality. Now, except for the boss fights against Donkey Kong, each level requires players to get a key from one point of the stage to a door in another. This allows Mario to chase after Donkey Kong further. Complicating matters are the game's puzzle-like stages, which are not only tests of dexterity, but also intellect as you puzzle out the best route, or at least the one the programmers wanted you to take, through each level. The hammer from the original game is back, letting you fight both enemies and smash open passages. You can also collect Pauline's missing items, the hat, the umbrella, and the purse along the way, just as you did in the original game. Collect all of them in a stage, and you get the chance to win more extra lives in a special bonus round. Those rounds are potentially available after each stage, which means you can rack up a pretty healthy amount of extra tries. Which is good, because this game can really be challenging. The diverse array of environmental hazards, from spikes and fire to gusts of wind, the enemies that can sometimes move faster than you can, and even DK's mischievous son Donkey Kong Jr., who will manipulate stage states to make you contend with changing conditions, all mean that there's just more that can kill you than there was in the original game. The game also borrows the physics and rules of the original game. Mario's walk movements and animation mirror the one-step-at-a-time pace of the original, though slightly faster, and falls from high enough heights can temporarily incapacitate or even kill the little plumber, and each stage is also timed to discourage dilly-dallying. So far, none of this is too shocking, but DK94 is not just a pure homage to the original arcade game, and that's where I really want to dive into what makes this game special. I argue that DK94 is not really just a game onto itself, it's a culmination of everything that Nintendo developers had learned and experimented on throughout the entirety of the Mario franchise at that point. So, for instance, Mario can now pick up objects and throw them, like he could in Super Mario Bros. 2, and can even climb ropes and vines two at a time to move faster, like Donkey Kong Jr. could in his game. However, it is in Mario's much broader moveset that DK94's secret importance to the broader franchise is truly unveiled. Mario can, quite frankly, move in this game, despite the aforementioned more intentional walk cycle. The developers utilized every possible configuration of the two buttons and directional pad of the original Game Boy to give the world's most famous plumber a moveset that rivals most Olympic gymnasts. So for instance, if the player pushes down and the jump button at the same time, Mario does a handstand. The handstand, apart from letting you stylishly stunt on fools, serves multiple purposes. When most thrown objects hit Mario's feet in the handstand, he'll simply kick them away, both neutralizing the object and allowing you to pick it up and throw it back. This is vital to later boss fights. Moreover, if you jump out of the handstand by pushing the jump button again, and then hit the jump button yet again after Mario hits the ground from the first jump, he'll make a second, equally powerful leap. Moving forward and then pushing in the opposite direction while pushing jump as well can give Mario a powerful backflip that reaches a much higher peak and favorable arc than his standard jump. In some levels, it's way faster than climbing ladders. The game can also give you opportunities to catch yourself and avoid disaster. Push forward as you fall off a not too tall ledge, and Mario can even tuck and roll, giving you smoother movement and sometimes even allowing you to avoid a stun animation. And of course, he can swim. He'd been able to swim for a while at this point. He picked it up since the original Donkey Kong, so it's here. He can do it. It's an incredibly diverse moveset, and one that can help skilled players get through levels even more efficiently or save themselves from dire outcomes. 
It's also clearly the precursor to the moveset that Mario would acquire in his later 3D adventures. The idea of Mario doing backflips and double and triple jumps starts here, two years before Mario 64 would popularize it and later games would expand on it. Moreover, the game makes a conscious effort to slowly roll out new mechanics and ideas. When Mario wins a boss fight against Donkey Kong, the ensuing animation teaches you about new mechanics in the next levels. For instance, here the game shows you that the mummy-like enemies in the desert levels are safe to pick up and throw. Here you learn that the mushrooms you see later are going to make you shrink instead of grow, and so forth. These cute animations actually do a great deal of heavy lifting in explaining the game's mechanics, so players never feel overwhelmed. Now this is a lot, but it barely scratches the surface of what this game has to offer, and a lot of it is best left to be discovered as a surprise to new players, so I'll leave it at this point and move on to our takeaways from the game. DK94 is a great example of game design by way of Dan Cook's concept of skill chains and skill atoms. The short version is that Cook argues that players can take actions, notice what happens and receive feedback, and then learn from those actions to update their concept of what is possible, chain together simple actions into more complex ones. For example, in this game, if you push a button and Mario jumps, you know that he can jump. If you push forward and then backward, Mario will turn on a dime. If you do both, you do a backflip. Now the backflip you learn is a higher arc than your regular jump, so you start experimenting with it and learn that you can use it to get to locations the regular jump cannot, or even more effectively dodge incoming danger with it. Nintendo EAD's strategy of giving you all the tools but showing you different use cases and letting you figure out how best to use them lets you take your existing knowledge of the game and improvise to at least an extent to solve its challenges. For instance, look at how I'm playing this level. Notice that I overshoot just a bit on this platform here, and I start to fall. Whoops! I know this is a potentially fatal height, however, luckily, I hit a block that I know can be placed anywhere in the level. I simply move it around, and knowing that if I hit a roll, I will not take the fatal damage, I place the block in my path and roll onto it, avoiding catastrophe. The game is full of little moments like this, rewarding players for thinking laterally and using the abilities given to them. What's more significant is that DK94 does all of this on the limited screen, hardware, and control mechanisms of the original Game Boy. You have only two buttons and a D-pad, yet Mario is capable of doing many amazing things. One of the biggest takeaways here is that simplicity does not necessarily mean a lack of options. By keeping the controls simple and the actions intuitive, players can chain together multiple skills and arrive at their own solutions to problems. Don't overwhelm the player with what they can do, give them a thorough grounding of what is possible, and let them figure out how best to do it. In summary, DK94 is maybe not the most obscure game in the Game Boy catalog, but it is arguably one of the best, and certainly one of the most fascinating. Few handheld games at the time or since have packed so much into one cartridge with the amount of charm and personality this game has, and to this day, it still holds up remarkably well. Unfortunately, it can be a little bit tricky to get your hands on this game through official means. It was added to the 3DS eShop Virtual Console, but that has really since been shut down. It seems ripe to add to Nintendo Switch Online's Game Boy catalog, but it's nowhere to be seen. Meanwhile, substantially worse games are readily available. Yes, I'm talking about you, Castlevania Legends. Still, if you can get your hands on it, I encourage you to check out DK94. It is the best entry in a truly legendary rivalry. I'm Brian Carr, and thanks for tuning into this episode of Pocket Pedagogy. Next time on Pocket Pedagogy, football's been very, very good to me. Well, it's been okay, I don't want to oversell it.